Hadith number 33 of Imam, Arba, uh, Imam Nawi's Arba'een is a very interesting hadith and I really enjoyed this hadith looking, looking it up today. From Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal law yu'ta al-nasu bida'wahum laddaa rijalun amwala qawmin wa dima'ahum lakin al-bayyinatu ala al-mudda'i wal-yameenu ala man ankar hadha hadithun hasanun rawahu al-bayhaqiyu wa ghayruhu hakadha Ibn Abbas عنه, relates, now listen to this carefully, that Rasulullah said, if everybody was to just be given based on their claim, you make a claim and your, your claim is accepted and you get whatever you claim, then so many men would have claimed or laid claim to the wealth of people or even to their blood, which basically means that, oh, he killed my son or my cat or whatever so he needs to be killed for that so you can imagine that if there was no due process and if you just laid a claim and your claim was to be heard and accepted there'd be huge problems so essentially what the Prophet is saying there's a process you must go through and what is the process he says lakin however the process is the onus of proof is upon the claimant if I claim something, I must provide the proof. وَالْيَمِينُ عَلَى مَنْ أَنْكَرْ And the taking of an oath or swearing of an oath is upon the one who denies, is upon the, is, uh, is upon the, uh, the, uh, the, the accused as such. Okay? Now, what does that mean? This is actually for the judicial process of Islam. Again, it's a very short narration because the first part is just a prelude to say, had it been so easy, then it would have caused chaos. So then the Prophet ﷺ is giving a fiqhi, again, a juridical uh, procedure on how to deal with cases. And it's actually a beautiful procedure, right? Is anybody into law here? Does anybody have a law background here? No? Otherwise, it would have been helpful, actually, if you did. Um, this is the process. I have a claim, right? Or you've got a claim against me that I scratched your car. Right? I don't do that kind of stuff. But let's just say you've got a claim against me. So we go to the judge, the arbitrator. The procedure here that the Prophet is mentioning, and there's several other narrations that mention some other features here, right? because this is quite general. What has to happen now is the, the judge will ask the claimant, so you're the claimant, and you're saying, he scratched my car, or make it easy, I, you, your claim is that I owe you a thousand pounds. So he's going to say, okay, what's your proof? Right? So what is your proof? Oh, look at these emails. Or look at, I've got these two witnesses. They witness the fact that I lent him a thousand pounds. Right? And there's no proof or evidence of it coming back. So if you have the proof, right, then it's your case. I owe you a thousand pounds. In fact... The way the judicial system actually works is that you lay the claim. The judge should ask me first, is he right in what he's saying? And if I say, yes, he's right, I do owe him a thousand, then it's done and dusted. You don't have to bring any proof. Because that's what you call iqrar, confession. Confession is the strongest proof, right? Because if you do bring two witnesses or even four witnesses, they could all be false. But if I do iqrar, then I'm assuming even that could be false. I could just be saying, let him have it. I'm going to say it. I want to be incriminated. But generally that doesn't happen. So confession, that would be it. Now if I don't confess, I say no. That's why he's bringing me to court. Because if I had confessed, then we wouldn't have to come to court. Right? So generally there will be no confession. Right? Unless I have a change of mind or heart when I get to the court. So now he's going to ask you, al-bayyinatu ala al-mudda'i. Which basically means the burden of proof is on the claimant. Okay, you bring the proof. So you bring proof, you bring witness, evidence, whatever it is. If it's acceptable, now we, we, we will look into that as to what exactly is the proof. What is the quantum of that? What is the amount of that? How many people or what kind of proof works or not? Right? I'll explain that later. If you have the proof, alhamdulillah, right? Whether it's true or not or whatever the case, your proof is sufficient. If it fits the bill, then I owe you a thousand pounds. However, if you're not able to provide sufficient proof, then is the case thrown out? No. There's another procedure. 
That's what the Prophet ﷺ said here, is وَالْيَمِينُ عَلَى مَنْ أَنْكَرْ That only applies when the claimant cannot provide evidence. So then the judge will turn to me and say, okay, he can't provide evidence, but for you to basically exonerate yourself, you need to swear an oath now that I do not owe him a thousand pounds. Right, so if I now swear an oath, because for Muslims, swearing an oath is very important because you swear by Allah, that Allah is my witness. That is supposed to be effective. Or you swear in the Quran, that's supposed to be effective. There, there are people who can even swear falsely, but the majority of people will not. That's why actually what it says in terms of the procedure is that before you get the person to swear the oath, you must actually remind them of the seriousness of this, the burden he's taking on. You must tell him, look, if you swear a false oath, this is what you do for yourself in the hellfire. What's the point of this? It's only a thousand pounds. You give them all that. You give them that whole spiel, right? So you make it serious. And then, okay, if I swear an oath, then the case is thrown out according to the majority. Right? The case is thrown out according to the majority. There's no case left. He couldn't provide proof, and I swore an oath to say I'm, I, I don't owe the person any money. And the default status actually supports me. Because the default status is that I haven't given, uh, uh, the default status is that I don't owe him any money. Right? He can't prove it. Is the default status that you owe someone money, or is the default status that you don't owe somebody money? Does everybody owe somebody something? Or is the normal status is that you don't owe somebody money, right? So that, that's why. Now, the case is thrown out of court. That's it. It's as simple as that. Can you see how the safety nets work in place? Now let's look at some of the, pecu uh, the particularities here. Any system needs a conflict resolving process. For any system to be complete, and Islam is kamil and mutakamil, right? Islam is complete, and there are aspects in there which complete one another. So part of that, there's a judicial process. And this hadith, believe it or not, is actually one of the fundamental principles of the Islamic judicial process, right? So that's why this is so important. Now, if there's a claim, what kind of witness is accepted? What kind of witness what kind of testimony, what kind of proof is acceptable? So now that depends on this level of the claim. So for example, in cases where you're saying that somebody committed zina, that's a very difficult one, where you say somebody is fornicated and you will know about that, there's specific verses to do with that. In there, you actually need four men to bear witness. That is probably the most difficult proof to provide. When you claim that somebody has fornicated, you'd have to prove it through four men, no women. Right, women are not accepted here. It's that four men saw the act. Not that they thought so, or they have huge suspicion, or they have dominant opinion. No, they actually saw the graphic act, the penetration essentially. Right, that's what they'll have to do. And then it gets even more particular that they have to actually f uh, keep on this opinion until, this, until the, the penalty is, taken, is ta taking place. Right? So they can't even retract. If they retract, everybody... You know why this one is the most difficult? If one of them retracts, the other three get punished for slander. So it's a very difficult one. So people are going to think twice even before becoming a, a witness, even one of the four witnesses. It's almost like it's never going to happen type of thing. Unless, you, unless it was so public, right? Something. That's number one. That's the most difficult burden of proof. And there's verses in Surah Al-Nur that talk about that in detail. Right, number two. Believe it or not, killing is of a lower degree. Murder than zina. It's amazing. The reason for zina is that the Sharia does not want you to even discuss fornication. Because it psychologically, if you see that that person is going out with her, or she's flirting with him, or they're doing it, it creates in your mind that if they can do it, I can do it. It's just really unhealthy. The more zina that you discuss, the more shaitan will actually make, because it's just the way lust works psychologically. So that has the most difficult burden of proof. The next level is uh, essentially murders and all other, everything else in, uh, uh, where the sharia has provided a specific penalty, which are called the hudud. All right? Which are called the hudud. For example, stealing. 
drinking, right? And uh, the other one is slandering. These have specific designated penalties mentioned in the Sharia. So what is, if somebody says he slandered me, or she slandered me, or he drank wine, or he stole, what is the burden of proof there? In that one, you need two men. Again here, women are, not, uh, women are not accepted. You need two men in this case. Not four, you need two men. All right? Women are not accepted in this. That's why uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Talaq, وَأَشْهِدُوا ذَوَيْ عَدَلٍ مِّنْكُمْ Right? You uh, bring us proof to upright men. Okay? And there's other verses as well. Number three, the third level, are other smaller monetary issues. Claim, claim, like your thousand pound issue, right? The claim of thousand pounds. That's less than zina, fornication. It's less than killing. It's less than, uh, what do you call it? Stealing and so on, right? It's just, you lent me money and I haven't given it back to you, for example. So in any claims that's to do with wealth uh, or, or transactions, uh, such as uh, purchases, uh, rentals, um, uh, lending money and so on, then that's where you, that's what the famous verse in the Quran you have for there is وَاسْتَشْهِدُوا شَهِيدَيْنِ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ Right? Uh, seek out two men as witnesses فَإِنْ لَمْ يَكُونَا رَجُلَيْنِ And if there aren't two men available, then فَرَجُلٌ وَمْرَأَتَانِ Then one man and two women. Alright? مِمَّنْ تَرْضَوْنَ مِنَ الشُّهَدَاءِ Among those that you would be satisfied with them as witnesses. So in this one, you can either have two men or one man and two women. Right, and the reason for one man and two women is generally women did not, uh, one of the reasons given is that generally women did not deal with these kind of matters. Right? This was, was not their forte to deal with business matters and things like that. Or number two, the, the, there are other reasons given as well, e emotional issues and things of that nature. We won't go into that right now. And number four then, there's a fourth level of burden of proof which is that those matters in which only women would know, right? They are personal issues to women, right? Women issues, uh, f for example, related to when somebody's born, right? I know you have a lot of male gynecologists nowadays, but I mean, generally, this is supposed to be a woman's forte. I still don't understand why you have male gynecologists. I still don't get that, right? I know it, it's probably one of the highest paid things in America, at least. Gynecologists are very high paid special, specialization. Right. Number two, whether somebody's still a virgin or not, if there's a reason to look for that, or whether uh, breastfeeding took place or not. You're not going to go and ask men about that. You ask women about that because they'll be more privy to these matters. So in that case, you bring women. This is where women would act as witnesses. Now, what's very interesting is that this is a very hard and fast rule. Let's say that the judge that you go to knows that Ahmed does owe the person money. He knows it because he's a family friend. Or he knows it from other ways. He knows it, 100%, no doubt. Is he allowed to legislate in court based on his knowledge? What do you think? He's not. He has to follow the same procedure. He'll tell the claimant, okay, you bring your evidence. Right, Qadi can't be the evidence. You know, Somebody will have to be. If he can't, he'll say, okay, you swear the oath. Can you imagine it? He, if he, if, he, if he knows even otherwise, then he knows that the, the witnesses are lying. He still has to legislate. And the Prophet ﷺ said that very clearly. He says that, look, sometimes some of you, when you come to me with cases, you're more eloquent than, your, than, than, than the other party. And sometimes I will actually legislate and decree for you because you've been more eloquent in conveying your, you know, in fighting your case. Right? That doesn't mean that I'm making halal for you what I'm legislating for you. You're basically, what you're doing by that is that you're basically securing for yourself just a piece of the hellfire. But due process has to be followed. Otherwise, can you imagine the corruption in that? If you corrupt judges, they'll just say, no, no, I know this. I, I've got personal knowledge about this. And then they'll legislate. There's no checks and balances in that. That's why this is very hard and fast rule. So this is the default situation. Now, some madhabs do have certain differences. Some imams do have certain differences, but this is not the time to go into it, right? For example, Imam Ahmed will have another process. Imam Malik will have slightly uh, a different process. Can, for example, if I'm the accused, 
right? And he, can't, he doesn't swear an oath. No, he can't bring proof. The claimant cannot bring any evidence. I'm told to swear an oath, but I say, look, rather than me swear an oath, let him swear an oath that he does, that I do owe him the money, and I'm willing to do that. Hanafi say, no, that's not agreed upon, because the hadith makes it very clear that you either bring evidence, the, the Prophet ﷺ told somebody, either you bring evidence, or he's going to swear an oath, there's nothing left, there's nothing beyond that. Meaning, if you want to swear evidence, if you, sorry, if you want to swear by Allah that he does owe you, that's not good enough. But according to some mathabs, that's good enough. So there are some differences like that in the slight difference in process, but otherwise the main framework is the same. Right? And I find that such a foolproof. I've used it sometimes. You know when you've got your children or somebody else that'll come about and they've got an issue, just use this process. Now, Imam Abu Hanifa, once he was forced to become a judge, because swearing by Allah is not a light idea. So... He took the position begrudgingly and now he's dealing with a case. So some guy comes along and he says, he owes me, I don't know, 50 pounds, right? 50 dirhams or whatever. So he says, have you got proof? Does he owe you? He goes, no, he doesn't owe me. Have you got witness? He says, I don't have any witness. So his witness was insufficient. So the process, okay, can you swear an oath? And the guy is about to swear an oath. The Imam says, stop, stop, stop. He pulled out 50 pounds. He said, just take it. I'd rather you, it's a petty amount. You'd rather take that than you swear by Allah. Right? Because swearing, you know, some people have this idea of just swearing all the time with Allah. It's, it's not good. It's discouraged. So, hopefully that gives us an explanation here. Right? Uh, if I'm to finish off by saying that the wisdom behind this, set, this distribution of burden is that the claimant, what he's claiming is something which is hidden. Right? Nobody knows. Otherwise, if it was clear, then there wouldn't be no reason for him to have to prove it, because it would be apparent, right? So he is essentially claiming something that is not so well known. So he needs evidence to be able to solidify it, right? That's why he has to bring the evidence. The claim, the, the, the accused, he is in a lighter position. He, the default is in, on his side. So swearing an oath is a lighter burden, is a lighter responsibility than bringing proof. So that's why he has to, his, his job is to just, to just to swear the oath. And that should suffice his situation just to repel and de deflect from him this accusation. That's basically the reason why, the background reason for this to happen. So let's stop here.